All right, minding your business community, welcome back. Episode number 193, Entrepreneurship Real Estate Trending News. There's no business like minding your own. I'm your host, Champ Ron, here for another um, riveting and exciting episode uh, that we're going to have today uh, with our guest and hope that you're doing well. Um, tough weekend. Uh, we're recording this on uh, Monday, August the 31st. So coming off a, a tough weekend for those uh, that follow the celebrity world. Uh, with some life transitions that uh, unfortunately took place. Um, you know, definitely uh, rest in peace to Chadwick Boseman, uh, who uh, played a number of really significant roles. Uh, that includes everything from James Brown to Jackie Robinson to, of course, uh, the Black Panther as uh, T'Challa in the Black Panther movies. Um, you know, uh, just this morning we got news of John Thompson, who was the former uh, Georgetown uh, University men's basketball coach, um, highly acclaimed, uh, you know, winning coach there at Georgetown University in D.C., uh, whose life transitioned as well. You had uh, Cliff Robinson, former NBA player, uh, actually UConn, uh, University of Connecticut star, and then uh, Portland Trailblazer star who transitioned. And so, um, you know, I, I hope that, uh, you know, people are doing as, as well as they can as, amongst all the you know, some of the tough news out there and just know that uh, we'll all get through, through this together uh, by being the very best for ourselves, the very best for our families and the very best for our communities. Um, on a much more positive note, uh, our guest today um, is a gentleman that uh, I think you're really going to enjoy there in the uh, Charlotte, North Carolina area. He's the managing partner at Vista Homes and at just 32 years old, uh, you know, leads a team of eight. Uh, to drive uh, over a million or over twenty million dollars, excuse me, um, in ARR, uh, his development and construction firm has uh, yeah, been involved uh, with sixty different units uh, currently in production uh, now as we speak, and you know just you know, all around just tremendous uh, guy and professional uh, that you're going to learn some uh, from today, MYB, and so Jason Javier is our guest today. Jason, thank you so much for joining. Thanks for having me, Champ. I appreciate it. Yeah, that's awesome, man. It's awesome to have you in. I know it's busy times and certainly busy times in your industry. Um, and so, but let, let, let's dial it back. Let's take a step back and, and get started here. Um, you know, Jason, for those that aren't familiar with you, um, tell us about, uh, you know, your background and your path and, and how you got to where you are today. Yeah, definitely. I appreciate you having on having me on here and I'm super excited to kind of tell my story and talk a little bit about the things that I've learned. I started out uh, working in uh, commercial real estate as a uh, analyst for a company in Chicago that was investing in commercial real estate, grocery anchor shopping centers. And they were doing some business in Charlotte, North Carolina. And at the time, uh, it was, this was around 2011 or so. So the housing market was kind of just after the, two, after the 2008 recession. And I just started reading yeah. up on residential real estate and it started to really pique my interest. And I had some friends that lived down in Charlotte. And when I went down to visit, it looked like a great place. And I was young, naive, kind of had irrational confidence <laughs> and said, hey, I'm going to go down to Charlotte and uh, try to do this residential real estate thing and kind of see how it goes. So I quit my job and moved down. And, uh, you know, as a 22, 23 year old kid, uh, it didn't work out. And, you know, it was a really tough time for me. And I had to uh, go and get a full-time job and then kind of keep working the real estate at nights and weekends. And, you know, pretty much it was a long, hard journey, but over time just kind of stuck with it. And uh, the business has kind of evolved to what it is today, um, which is, like you mentioned, kind of specializing in new construction with uh, doing some single family homes and some townhomes. Yeah, absolutely. And I love your tie to Chicago. That's actually where I'm originally from. I was born uh, in the Chicago area, uh, Heights area before, uh, you know, eventually coming here to Memphis, Tennessee. And awesome. so, uh, you know, that's tremendous. And and I spent a little time in Charlotte, too, um, in my time with uh, Bank of America. I uh, spent some time there. Of course, they're headquartered there and uh, got a chance to see the, the Charlotte market. It was uh, uh, tremendous. And uh, yeah, there's uh, been, from, you know, a ton of change in Charlotte over the last eight years. And we've been fortunate to, you know, be in a position to um, take advantage of that kind of growing dynamic city. And, and it's a place that a lot of people want to be right now. 
Yeah, no doubt about it. Um, geographically, it's located uh, very well. And uh, actually, most of my family is uh, from south of, of that Charlotte area there, Jason. Um, you know, my folks grew up in Columbia, South Carolina, where nice. you know, a large chunk of my family. So about hour, hour and a half south of uh, that Charlotte market is uh, where I've got a ton of uh, family connection. And so that's uh, incredible as well. Um, you mentioned, uh, you know, in that transition, you know, kind of leaving your job, uh, Jason, and a lot of people, yeah. um, you know, listening to this, uh, you know, have that same, uh, you know, I guess, outlook or, or same, uh, you know, dream to, to be able to do that. Um, you know, walk and unpack for us, you know, how you did that, um, you know, what was kind of your mindset? And then you yeah. mentioned having to go back into the job market. And so, you know, kind of unpack that for us a little bit. Yeah, I think initially kind of leaving my job uh, was maybe not the right time when I was 22, 23 years old and didn't really have like a solid footing in my business, quite frankly. Um, so what I did was I kind of uh, took a step back and realized that this was still something that I wanted to do, but I felt like I yeah. needed kind of a foundation. So I went and got a job as a financial analyst for a company uh, called Electrolux. They sell appliances. Yes. Very and pretty much worked there, you know, the standard nine to five and, you know, realized pretty quickly that, you know, that wasn't going to be fulfilling enough for me and that I wanted to stick with the, the real estate kind of was a passion of mine just to kind of be an entrepreneur and own my own business. So pretty much for the, you know, three, four years, I just worked nights and weekends and, you know, a little bit while I was on the job also, quite frankly, and just kind of kept saving up money. You know, I knew that for me, you know, that especially in residential real estate, like there could be a lot of time in between making money in, in the business that I was in. So I understood yeah. that there needed to be, you know, that financial, ba you know, backing and the financial stability, and which was what I didn't have the first time I tried to make the leap. So I was really kind of aware of, okay, like I have this much money saved. It will, you know, I could last me this long. And these are kind of some of the upcoming deals that I have. And I was, you know, a little bit more calculated um, the second go around to make sure that I was comfortable, you know, leaving the current job. Yeah, absolutely. And so I love the, um, the, the strategic approach that you had to it, um, the critical thinking that you applied, Jason, um, you, know, you know, that you articulated is, you know, first time you went out, you recognized, you know, where, where there was a gap. Obviously, you had to come by, you had to eat a little humble pie to, to kind of go back. And I want to reiterate that to the audience, um, to the NYB community that's listening, because, you know, sometimes when you have those setbacks, you have to be willing to go back, you know, kind of analyze, like Jason said, you know, where there's opportunity and then go. And you see you hear that, you know, Jason had a, a really good plan on what he wanted to do. He knew that wasn't long term. So whether so rather than sulking. And the fact that he had to go back and then work for Electrolux, he used that as a platform, as an opportunity to continue to, to work on his craft, uh, continue to work on the business, and then put himself in that much better of a situation. And so I encourage you all as you, you're listening to this and, you know, you know, maybe you've experienced, you know, a setback like that, or, you know, maybe you're just kind of coming out of one that, you know, continue to fight and to continue to have your plan. Um, and then execute on that. You heard Jason. I mean, he you know, obviously he's putting in time because you're working full time at Electrolux. Yeah, and yeah. Working your business, so it's. Yeah, for me, it was of, it was just the number one priority. Like I just knew I wasn't going to be happy, and I felt like I did have it was it was within my control to kind of realize this dream that I had to kind of you know be an entrepreneur and run my own business. So. You know, I just committed everything to it, you know, so in terms of my personal life and my finances, I made sure that, you know, it was the most important thing to me and that I made sure that my actions kind of backed up my goals. You know, I made sure yeah. that the path that I wanted to go on made sense. You know, I, I talk to a lot of people all the time where it's like, you know, I want to be a, a billionaire, but it's like, but you're not doing the little steps that you need to do every day to kind of get there. So I was yeah. pretty well aware of like what I needed to do and, and, you know, the steps that I kind of had to take. And for me, it was, you know, whether it took one year, five years or 15 years, like I wasn't, it was just, that's what I needed. I felt like to be happy. So it was like something yeah. I was willing to sacrifice for essentially. Yeah, exactly. And, and that's the type of courage and, and valor that you have to have, uh, quite frankly, uh, like you're describing Jason is, um, you know, to, to know what, what's going to fulfill you, what's going to um, kind of be your best route and then go for it and, and go all in 
And I think yeah. a lot of people, um, they, they're challenged with that because they kind of want, they kind of want to hand it to them. Right. Sometimes they, they, cause they, they want to shield themselves from the pain and what the potential risks are. And so they want someone to just come and just say, you know, here you go. Oh, here's, here's your dream. Right. <laughs> and, um, yeah. yeah and it just, you have to, you have to fight. Yeah. And it's just, it's, it's tough and it doesn't, it doesn't work like that. I, I remember, especially just cause you know, the real estate that I'm in with development and building and selling, it, it can be, you know, lucrative. Like I, you know, deals can be large. And I, I remember feeling like, Oh, if I just get this deal done, like that's going to be the deal that solves all my problems and makes me kind of get to that next level. And it's just amazing that it's not about that. I learned over time. It's about kind of that continuous, everyday effort and kind of pushing toward your goal essentially yeah yeah no doubt about it that, that's tremendous jason uh to say the least um i appreciate so you, it so you yeah, absolutely and so you you you're now in your business right you're with vista homes you're, you're a managing partner there um you know talk about you know that that evolution over time you get in you start doing deals you know how are those early deals um, you know, there are you, you know, I'm, I imagine there's some great joys. There's probably some things that you learned, uh, yeah. you know, kind of along the way. So kind of, you know, walk us through that a little bit. Yeah. I'll never. So, I mean, our business is a little bit of like, you know, finding deals off market. So we do different marketing strategies to get in touch with homeowners and I'll never forget the first deal that we got. And we knew like we were doing these marketing strategies that were new and we were doing them for six months and trying a bunch of different things and nothing was clicking. And I just remember like that first deal, like we finally got the the motivated seller. We finally met with them and it was like for a small condo project and we were probably going to make, I don't know, five or 10 grand or something. But I just remember like that feeling of happiness of like, wow, this might actually work. Like the thing that I've been pouring all this time into reading and understanding, it felt like it had a chance to actually work. Um, and then we kind of fast forward and this was with a, a business partner that, you know, that my other managing partner is Zeb over at Vista Homes. And, you know, now kind of fast forward. And now, like you mentioned, we're leading a team of eight people and it's still the same core principles, you know, when we did that first deal. But now we also have the added elements of, you know, leading a team and being, you know, a leader to them and trying to help kind of guide the ship. And it's, you know, you're working on some more high level items, I guess, within the business. Sure. Absolutely. And, and where do you, where are you all typically doing business, you know, nowadays? Are you, you kind of, yeah, you know, we focus in, certain in area or? yeah, we primarily focus in infill development. So what that means is pretty yeah. much everything we do is within a few miles of uptown of center city, Charlotte. And we focus a lot on projects that are going to be anywhere from two units to 15 units. So we're kind of like a little bit larger than a, than a mom and pop builder at this point, but we're not, you know, doing projects quite the scale of a national regional builder that's kind of in town. So that's kind of our niche to kind of be in these, you know, core neighborhoods where we're seeing growth and in that price point of 400,000 to $800,000. So awesome. um, over time, as you, you know, you build a team out, you, you realize the importance of trying to really kind of create your box, create your niche and stay within it and, and try to kind of streamline things as much as possible so that your team can, continue to be put in the right place to execute and succeed. Yeah. And, and I love the way you put that, you know, kind of, you know, streamline to your niche because, you know, sometimes you, you, you come across folks and, and, you know, some may even be listening is that they try to be everything to everybody, right? And it's, it's easy to get tempted into you know, thinking that, you know, well, everybody's my core audience. I want to try to sell it to as many people as possible. And it doesn't matter what you're selling, even if you're selling toilet tissue, everyone's not your target audience, right? And so, yeah, for um, sure. <laughs> you know, it's so, hard. I mean, especially um, in real estate, there's the, you know, the shiny object syndrome where like yeah, everything yeah. looks like it's, yo, I got to do this, I got to do this, I got to, you know. Right. But if you can get really good at one thing, uh, you can generally find, I believe, more success. Yeah. And that's what I learned that early on. So I, I speak from experience with that um, and certainly not from theory at all. Um, you know, yeah. I, I once, you know, when I first started in, in real estate, I, I wanted to do everything, you know, I, you know, um, Airbnb jumps in, you know, I, I wanted to run over here and then, you know, like you say, fix and flips and then, um, you know, commercial that, you know, I want to be everything to everybody and, and kind of, yeah. have this, you know, you know, do you do that? Yeah, I do it, you know, <laughs> because you're anxious to do a deal. You're anxious to get to the money. Right. 
Yeah. And so, you know, I learned. I joke with my business yeah. partner, like anytime we've ever done something new and different, it's always been less profitable and cost more and taken longer than what we plan. Like there's just, it's like no matter what happens, like that's what's going to happen. So it's like even more why kind of chasing those shiny objects is challenging. Right, exactly. And that's what, you know, I, I learned is uh, when I uh, began to, to really hone in and focus on wholesaling um, you know, with, with kind of a, 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 a emphasis on, you know, ensuring, you know, providing affordable housing, you know, you know here within this Memphis community and kind of surrounding counties. Um, you know, I did, I just simply did much better. Um, same when I launched, you know, my consulting practice, you know, I, I couldn't be everything to every bank, right? I, so I focused in on just community banks in the Midwest and a ton of community banks and an opportunity for those communities to, to grow, um, as a lot of population went to the coast. Right. right. right? And so, like you said, it, that's just been the, um, yeah, the, the focus at, at focusing in on that niche, Jason. So I'm, I'm great to hear you, you know, kind of speak on that from your end, because that's been something that I learned the hard way. <laughs> yeah, for sure. It happens to everyone. Um, you know, one of the principles, the guiding principles that I think has kind of helped my success is uh, I read a book called the one thing, and it just talked about like, as a small business owner, if there's one thing, you know, figure out that one thing that you can do every day so that if you can accomplish that one thing, it will tend to kind of take care of the rest of your issues. Um, and that's something that I always think about. And for us, it was, you know, being the, the ability to find good opportunities and still is to this day. Uh, and so that's just continuing yeah. something that I kind of let small business owners and young entrepreneurs know is like, figure out what that one thing is that you need to do well and make sure that you're, you're really kind of capitalizing on it. Yep, absolutely. No doubt about it. Um, so, so Jason, as you focus on, actually you guys have your niche and, and that sort of thing, you know, there in that Charlotte area, you know, just talk about the Charlotte market just all together and, and, you know, maybe how it might compare to some other markets, um, where other people are doing business. Obviously it's a unique market, um, there in, in Charlotte and, you know, but, yeah. uh, what, you know, what really attracts you, you guys there to, to continue to invest? Yeah, I think Charlotte's in a just position in a perfect kind of location and price point. I think you're getting a lot of people from the Northeast that want to move down to Charlotte and avoid some of the higher, you know, expensive areas. And then you maybe have some people that are in the Midwest or some, you know, areas that aren't quite as expensive, but they want to have the quality and lifestyle that Charlotte's able to bring. And we're seeing that it's kind of been, which it's crazy because you know the times we're going through with COVID. It's it's been, it's been crazy for everybody, but you know the real estate market has held really strong, and if not, has probably maybe even gotten a little bit stronger. You know throughout COVID, and I think it's just people that are now kind of been in these maybe small apartments in Manhattan or you know different areas, and they're like, I want to get down to Charlotte where I can enjoy the weather, I can enjoy the business and the growth. And one thing that's awesome to see in Charlotte, I think, is that people that have been here start to have a real like affinity and love for the city and the growth that's kind of happening. And they feel like this is kind of their city. Um, so I think that all those kind of things combined kind of make Charlotte a really attractive place for us to continue to invest in real estate. You may have cut out a little bit. You there? Hey, can you hear me? Yep, I can hear you. So that's okay. I think we, uh, I think there was an internet issue on my end for some reason. And yeah, I wasn't sure. I'm, I'm, a, I am on Wi-Fi in my office because the camera I don't have on my desktop. Yeah, but hopefully no, it wasn't I, I, that. Oh no, I can edit out. That's not an issue. Okay, but, cool. Uh, but yeah, today. So today was the first day of school here locally, um, and it, it was all virtual, and so 
you know, one of the larger school systems went all virtual. And so I'm, I, I was always concerned as to what impact that might have on Wi-Fi with, you know, 90,000 kids now. All <laughs> yeah, <laughs> um, no, that's, that makes sense. Home. Yeah, you were cutting out like just a little bit at times, but not like what just happened, I guess. Yeah. Yep. So no, no worries, but, um, let's, uh, let's jump back in, um, with that. So, uh, Jason, from you all standpoint with the Charlotte market, uh, talk to me a little bit about, you know, the Charlotte market that you all invest in, you know, what attracts you to it, um, and, and how you kind of compare and contrast it with maybe some other similar markets, um, you know, kind of around the country. Yeah, I think the same things that kind of attracted me to Charlotte hold true today. So I was attracted to Charlotte because of the weather and what seemed like, you know, a, a better kind of cost of living, quality of life compared to a Chicago. And I'm from the Northeast, from New York originally. And as I oh. looked at Charlotte and looked at those areas, you know, it, it just didn't cost as much as, as, you know, living in those places. And then we also see a lot of people from the um, other parts of the Midwest and Northeast that want to come down for the climate and maybe the costs aren't necessarily cheaper than where they live, but the, they feel like the quality of life is certainly better. Um, so I think all those things still hold true today and may have even been accelerated through um, some of the coronavirus pandemic that we're, you know, dealing with right now. And uh, I yeah. think that I was mentioning, like, I, you know, people have a real affinity towards Charlotte. I think the people that have been down here, it starts to become yeah. their city and you get a lot of transplants, which, you know, is unique probably to the city. There's not a ton of people sure. that are kind of born and bred Charlotte, I guess, but uh, yeah. people start to just love it. And they, you know, they want to support the local businesses around and, and the bars and restaurants and the, the growth that's kind of happening within the community. And it being like a newer city that's kind of booming, I think that it's being developed in a way that is very attractive to um, millennials and people that are just out of school that are looking for, you know, a cool city to live in. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, in my time there, I kind of gathered that too, that it's a, it's a large enough city to have some major player things going on. Obviously, it's got, you know, professional sports. It's, um, you know, from a weather standpoint, it tends to be, I mean, certainly, like you say, being from New York, you know, that well yeah can impact things and you talked about cost of living um that sort of thing of course you know having the the major hub from a an airport standpoint uh right makes it tremendous. yeah all those things with um, the businesses and lower taxes certainly help as well yeah no doubt about it um jason you mentioned about you know the you know pandemic and what the you know COVID 19 uh coronavirus uh has that had any kind of impact either way on, on your business and that, you know, ability to, to do business uh, during this time? Yeah, we were fortunate. I mean, we, we had slow sales for 30, 45 days. And then I think as people got a little bit more comfortable in quotations with a little bit of the new normal, um, we've never been stronger from a sales perspective. Um, yeah. we, you know, we're starting to see some kind of shortages of materials and some lumber spikes and costs and things of that nature. But I mean, overall, given the you know severity of the pandemic and what you're kind of seeing across, you know, the country across the world, like we feel really fortunate to be in the position we are, considering you know what's going on out there. Yeah, yeah, no doubt about it. And yeah, of course, you're well aware of all the businesses and, and individuals that have been impacted here currently. As we, you know, actually we're approaching uh, month six of you know kind of the the breath yeah. of the pandemic hitting and. And that sort of thing, um, you know. So you know, definitely, it's uh, you know, you know, you know, tough times for many, but uh, it also creates a, a lot of opportunities uh, for many as well. And so, you know, what do you see kind of on the horizon? Um, you know, certainly there in your local market, you talked about the growth. You talked about, um, you know, you know, some of the you know, the real benefits of of people locating to Charlotte. Um, in my opinion, I think that's going to continue because. Um, a couple things this pandemic's highlighted. One, um, senior leaders in a lot of companies are realizing that um, they can do without as much commercial real estate as maybe they had in the past, that mm -hmm. their teams can function at maybe not always 100% optimal level, but at enough of a level to offset, you know, the cost and expense of commercial real estate. And so I'm interested, you know, in, in what commercial real estate will look like for us here in the next, you know, three to five years. But, yeah, for um, sure. You know, for for Charlotte, for the Charlotte market, I think is very prime because you know, listen, you're kind of 
you know, from the Northeast, right? Like we were just talking about, you've got all those costs. You were just talking about the ability to work, um, you know, from wherever now with technology. And, you know, do you see, you know, Charlotte kind of being in this almost kind of somewhat tech hub of, um, you know, people able to relocate there, uh, even though they're working for someone in Chicago or New York or Los Angeles or, or quite frankly, anywhere in the world, you know, Jason, that yeah. they could come there, get, you know, much more, you know, in some cases, more affordable housing, maybe be closer to the family um, and, and be able to travel because, you know, from Charlotte, you're not far from coast and, you know. Um, yeah, definitely. That sort of you're kind of so. like equidistant to a lot of the great things. Yeah. You know, it's hard to say, it's hard to say like how businesses are going to kind of respond long term. It's something that I talk about a lot with my business partner in terms of, you know, how is the office going to look in six months to a year? Um, but I will say for our side of the business of residential real estate, you know, residential real estate's never been a more desirable product. I mean, people want to have their own home. They want to have their own space. So it's hard to say if like, you know, these companies that are in New York are going to allow people even more flexibility to kind of live wherever they want. But I do think that given that opportunity, I think that, yeah, more and more people may, you know, look to leave some of the Manhattans and San Francisco's and, and come down to places like Charlotte and Denver and Nashville. And I guess these 18 yeah. hour cities that you kind of read about, I, I do think that and, and, you know, anywhere, I mean, I think it's, it's really, it could be an amazing opportunity because it really could allow people to create the life that they want, you know, and it, you don't yeah. need to live in a thousand square, you know, very tiny apartment in Manhattan. Like, what does that set you up for? I mean, you can right. do a lot of different things and it, it could be really exciting if, if those types of kind of avenues are possible. Cause I think it kind of continues to push that message of, kind of creating that lifestyle that you, that you want. I think that was the biggest thing for me as an entrepreneur yeah. and starting my own business that I focus on is, you know, I just want to create a happy lifestyle and yeah. I try to do a lot of things and invest a lot of things in, in my happiness. And what makes me happy is not going to be what makes someone else happy. Um, but I think I do a pretty good job of understanding like what it is that makes me happy so that I can focus on those things and reinvest. So to your point, yeah, if corporations allow people that flex even more flexibility, that could be an amazing thing for individuals. And, you know, they might be able to continue to work, but then still feel a lot of the the freedoms that maybe come with being a business owner. And maybe that's even more of a self-reflection and ability to understand yourself. Yeah. And, and you touch on something that's, that's really intriguing that I'd love to get your, your opinion on, uh, Jason, that, you know, just in, in dialogue is that last point that you made in terms of, um, you know, from a lifestyle standpoint that, um, and real estate, you know, is, I mean, kind of right there at the top as a business that people can get in that doesn't require, you know, it, you know, for example, I see these people get on Shark Tank and, you know, nothing against them, but, you know, you got to have some money and some capital to sell a bunch of product, right? You know, you, right. you get a bunch of whatever things that we're eating and drinking and whatever, it's great, but you got to have a lot of upfront money and you, you, you it, sometimes to get proof of concept requires a significant investment. Uh, real estate's not like that. You know, you can get involved in real estate at a lot of different levels from the investor standpoint. And Definitely. Then certainly, um, you know, residential real estate is, is obviously tremendous um, and, and has a really vetted proof of concept, uh, of course, if you do it right. And so I'd love to get your, your opinion on, you know, again, the lifestyle piece that people could, you know, for Charlotte, for example, could relocate to Charlotte, um, work for a company, right? But mm -hmm. then have, you know, um, because of that flexibility and autonomy that they get from working at home, uh, there's this opportunity then Jason to dive into, you know, entrepreneurship or have some kind of business. And so um, continue to do their job, obviously very well at the optimal level, but because they could come and, and live in one of your units, right. That you right. guys, um, you know, put together, you know, they could relocate here, get a much bigger unit, more space, less money, um, and have that opportunity to kind of balance out, you know, maybe, you know, I, I, you know, work a little, you know, some real estate deals on the side, while I'm on all these zooms and everything, you know, kind of with yeah, my job. for sure. And so I'd love to get your thoughts on that. Cause that's a, I think that's a tremendous lifestyle for millennials. Um, I, but I think even across, um, you know, kind of demographic that that could create a lot of, uh, open opportunities for people. Yeah. I think you hit it on the head. I mean, people should understand 
what it is that makes them tick and what they're kind of really passionate about. And if they really want to, you know, I think it's a challenge still to like, you know, get going and get momentum in a business, but, you know, having that ability to kind of get out there and take action and to create value is certainly a way to uh, add income in residential real estate and, you know, add income to your life. And again, kind of create whatever that lifestyle might be for, for you really. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, and kind of along these same lines, yo, let's talk family a little bit. Um, you know, in reading about you, Jason, uh, you obviously, you know, your parents kind of come from uh, kind of different walks of, of life. Um, you know, your dad was an entrepreneur, um, you know, that I was able to read and, and kind of learn some about. So, you know, talk, you know, talk to me a little bit about family, the importance of family kind of coming up that, you know, kind of helped you, uh, help guide you to you know, getting kind of where you are. Um, I think yeah, I think that, especially, uh, yeah, my dad's side, you know, entrepreneurship is kind of like in the family a little bit. So I was able to learn a yeah. lot by seeing my dad and his business and the things that, um, you know, went well and the things that he probably would have looked back and say, you know, maybe if I would have done things a little bit differently, like the outcome could have been even better. Um, I think with his business, he was in the, the lumber industry with um, insurance and a lot of things changed in 2008 and 2009. And, you know, I think there's a lot of really good lessons that I'm able to learn from that in terms of, you know, really understanding that like nothing is guaranteed forever. So we might be doing right. well today, but, you know, I understand that the world can change tomorrow. And we've seen it this year, like COVID was something that changed the world for a lot of different industries and businesses. So, absolutely, you know, for me, it's about not kind of taking my eye off the ball from a business standpoint. And always, you know, I feel like we need to always improve and always get better and always kind of, um, you know, create things that will help us be sustainable because you just can't predict what the future is going to hold. And for me, like my most important thing is like the privilege of running my own business. So I'm willing to kind of sacrifice and do the things that, that are necessary, really, and just kind of continue to grow and improve on them. Because I think it's really easy in business to get complacent. And it's like a lot of the things that we did eight years ago don't work anymore. Um, and we're doing new things all the time. And it's, I never thought that, that was going to be the case when I got into business that it's just an ever evolving challenge and it's tough. And a lot of people want to um, own their own business and be successful entrepreneurs. And especially in these times, it's like, it seems like it's like, you know, the sexy thing to do is go run your own business and have an IPO and, you know, get venture capital <laughs> funds. And it's like, that's not, right. it's just tough. And, you know, if you want those things, then you're going to have to um, continue to work hard and work long and to and improve to kind of make that sustainable. So that's kind of the biggest thing that I learned kind of seeing my dad's business kind of just ebb and flow. And, you know, it's just kind of what happened. And it's just a really good, you know, experience for me to go through and to see, to understand that, yeah, anything can happen tomorrow. So we need to make sure we're always improving and doing what we need to today to to weather any storm, really. Yeah, good insight for sure, Jason. Um, how do you define success? You know, so when you look at you know success for you know, let's say for Vista Homes, right? What is yeah. what is success and how is that measured for you guys? I think for me personally, success is really based around my goals. So I don't have a goal to have a private jet or to have fancy things and fancy cars. Like for me, I believe if I can have more and more time, then I could turn that time into something that's going to make me happy. Right. And I definitely deal with kind of financial stress, financial anxiety, potentially like always thinking about the worst case thing. So for me, it's about understanding myself and continuing to invest to in that happiness muscle of um, the things that, you know, make me happy, which for me, it's time and financial security and being able to, you know, use that time to um, help others and to spend time with friends and family. So I think really for success, you have to define your own goals. I mean, I was interviewing someone recently and they like those fancy things and the fancy things are the, what gets them going and gets them motivated and gets them continuing to push forward. And if that's what gets you happy, then by all means. But I think it's really important that we, um, you know, do things that make us happy and we're not worried about what other people think or say, or mm. it's just like, do what's going to make you happy. Don't go buy things or do things because uh, you think that you're going to look cool to this person or it's important to those other people. 
I think right. the, the message of like create the life that, that you want, that's going to make you happy. I don't think that there's like, uh, you know, making X do- number of dollars a year is going to, you know, there's no secret like, Hey, if you make X number, you're going to be happy. It's, it's about your understanding yourself and, uh, kind of pulling out what's important to you really. Yeah, you're, you're exactly right, Jason. I, I've shared with this audience before that, you know, my wife and I have had years where we've made, uh, I, I a significant amount of money. We, we've had years where we've done very well. And I'll tell you that the, the, the times when we focused on, um, you know, like you said, what, what was really important, what we really enjoyed, what we really wanted to have. Um, yeah, there have been other years and times where we've made less money, but we just enjoyed it more. We had more fun. Yeah. We did more of the things that we wanted to do. And so, you know, obviously a lot of people listening, a lot of people come up thinking that, I've got to make a hundred thousand dollars a year, or I've got to get to where I make a million dollars a year or 10 million dollars, whatever that number is. But you're, you know, it's, it's kind of like that Russian proverb. If you, you chase two rabbits, you won't catch either one. And so right. what happens is you, you, you'll chase you, You're never satisfied. Right. Cause, and what happens when you make a ton of money too, is yeah, obviously you know, the, the more radar screens you hit, and so I remember making a ton of money and I would get calls from everybody that wanted to be my friend all of a sudden. Right. Right. <laughs> um, right. I get invited to things that, you know, it's like, I normally wouldn't attend anything like this, but now I get invited to everything that I got to wear a penguin suit to, um, and eat a rubber chicken, you know, for dinner. And right. Get and it's not your don't... thing. And it wasn't what you were looking for at the end no, of the day. No, at the end of the day, I'm like, you know, yeah, I, I don't, you know, these aren't the type of people that I really want to network with. And I, I don't really get enjoyment from, you know, trying to be, uh, you know, the, the, the guy that everybody wants a check from and, you know, right. kind of running around, you know, like that. I, I like a much more, uh, you know, kind of, you know, you know, kind of, you know, a little bit more modest and, you know, a little bit more uh, grassroots type of lifestyle. And so, um, yeah, yeah, and I think that's that- what's so cool about like platforms like this and podcasts is that in the past, like there weren't as many people kind of spreading this kind of message. I mean, you're yeah. watching TV, radio, you know, you see <laughs> fancy commercials and, uh, you <laughs> right. know, all that kind of good stuff. And it's like you're not getting this kind of message. Um, and I feel like throughout my process of learning and, you know, there were obviously a, a lot of ups and downs and there tends to be more downs than ups when you're getting started and sure. being able to turn to you know, people like yourself that are spreading these kind of messages and, and different podcasters and blogs. It, it's a, it's an awesome medium that I think today's kind of small business owner entrepreneur can learn anything and can expose themselves to, you know, all these great ideas and understandings. And I think if you yeah. could kind of create that foundation of understanding what makes you happy, then that's going to really help when you're, you know, growing a business or you're maybe working that full-time job and you, but you want to make some extra side hustle money or, you know, whatever that is, I think you need to under, really understand your goals and then map toward them. And these yeah. platforms allow people to understand that. Yeah, you're exactly right. And it's one of the things that attracted me, you know, initially to uh, podcasting, Jason, was one, owning, owning my own narrative, um, owning my own voice, amplifying that, and then being able to share that, um, you know, it's okay to kind of grow and, you know, as long as you're doing what you enjoy, you know, you don't have to chase, like you say, the shiny object, you don't have to chase the lifestyle that you're just, you, you know, adopting to appease, you know, someone else. I mean, it, you know, yeah. it, it can, you know, some things can look good and they can look great, but if, if it's at the end of the day, if it, like you said, if it doesn't bring you joy, it doesn't make you happy, you know, then, then why are you doing it? And there's no amount of money, no amount of, you know, size house, no matter how many square foot your house is, no matter how many friends you got telling you that you're great, um, you know, no matter, you know, how much in shape or out of shape that you are, that sort of thing. If if you're doing things that ultimately don't make you happy, you know, it can make it eventually, you know, hard to sleep at night. And, you know, that yeah, and I think it, the idea that it, happiness can be a muscle, too, and it's something that you, you work towards and you understand what's going to make you happy, but then you're kind of every day trying to kind of improve and get better and better at whatever those those items might be. I think that for me has been the most rewarding part is kind of tracking the successes and seeing them and understanding how it's kind of impacting my life and the people around me at this point. Yeah. 
Absolutely. Um, let's get into a fun question here, Jason. Um, you know, if I were to, you know, we just, you know, kind of talked about lifestyles. So I, I likely know the answer to what you're, you know, what, how you may respond to this, but I always like to ask guests, what would you do with a hundred million dollars in cash? That was, um, you know, no strings attached, um, everything IRS, everybody's been taken care of. And I show up and I bring you a hundred million dollars in cash. You know, what would you do with that and why? Yeah, I think the boring answer, and but it kind of fits <laughs> me and who I am and what I care about is I'd probably figure out some kind of somewhat safe, diversified way to kind of put a bunch of it away and to say like, okay, it's going to earn me X amount of dollars a year and I can live off of this and I can take care of my friends and family. And then I'd probably save a, a sliver of it to get involved in some kind of investing passion projects. You know, maybe it's something real estate related, uh, something sure. that's fun because I do really enjoy business. So I would definitely want to take some of that money and invest it. But at the same time, I'd realize like, I need to really figure out what's going to make me completely happy because that's going to give me all the, the time and everything that I need at that point, you know? So it's not like I'm going to sit here and say, I'm going to take it and try to make it into $3 billion because like, right. I don't know that I would do that if I right. really was given that kind of money. Um, yeah. So it's hard, you know, so if you got yeah. that, let me know. <laughs> yeah. They, yeah. That's right. I made my way to Charlotte. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Appreciate it. Yeah, no doubt about it. You know, Jason, this has been a tremendous dialogue, man, just to say the least. And, um, you know, kind of as we wrap up, I, I'd love to hear kind of, you know, you know, one or two best practices that you use kind of, you know, use consistently, use daily um, that have that work for you that will work for someone else. Because, you know, listen, yeah. people are listening to this and they're hurting. Um, and there's some people, again, they're, they're doing extremely well. Um, but then there's some other folks that have, you know, experienced job loss, maybe their business isn't going in the direction that they want. Um, maybe they've got other challenges. Maybe the, the business is growing faster than they can keep pace with, you know, and sometimes yeah. that can create, um, you know, issues as well. And so, you know, for all those folks that may be in these various, um, situations, you know, what are just one or two best practices again, that work for you that you think will work for them? I think the single most important thing when you're getting started is to take action, to be comfortable kind of getting out of your comfort zone. Uh, yeah. You know, if you don't get started and you don't take those little steps, then you're never going to kind of get anywhere. I mean, I'm not naturally someone that um, should be up here on this screen and talking to you and networking and talking about my business. But to me, it's something that's important and it's just another step along the way of taking action. You know, when we first started our business and we were doing different marketing techniques, one of the first things we did was we sent out those the yellow letters to people to try to um, yeah. get their business. No one ever has ever taught me how to send a yellow letter. You know, I didn't learn that in some textbook in school, but I read about it when I spent a lot of time learning. And I said, you know what, this is something that people are doing across the country that's working. I'm going to do it because I think it has a chance to work. And when the calls came in, I had no idea what I was doing, but I took action and I learned and I kind of kept going. So I think the biggest thing is kind of take action. It's going to feel uncomfortable. Sure. Uh, you're going to have a pit in your stomach, but over time it'll get more and more natural. And when you're kind of stretching yourself outside your comfort zone is when you're going to see the most growth. Uh, if everything feels completely natural to you, I think it, you're not going to really be growing maybe and not necessarily growing financially, but growing yourself as a person, as an individual and kind of moving forward. So I think yeah. naturally, if you're getting started in business, kind of taking action is going to be, you know, the first big thing. And then like we've talked about has been a common theme is just the second thing would be just to understand what makes you happy, understand what kind of life you want, understand that the goal isn't to make a million dollars a year. If that's what you really want and that's your goal, then by all means, like go after it. But understand that you are in control of your life. You are in control of how you spend your money. You're in control of where you live, what you do. And, you know, you can make those things happen, but it's going to take, you know, understanding what you want and doing those things. Because with every, you know, action, there's going to be consequences, both positive and negative. Yeah. Absolutely. Two and, and two tremendous, you know, best practices, obviously getting out of your comfort zone and, you know, doing what makes you happy. And you're exactly right, Jason, even in that example of, you know, what I find is what, what people say they want to make a million dollars a year is rooted in their vanity of wanting to be a big shot and wanting to be recognized 
recognized and things like that. And, 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 and there's some, you know, benefit and I can see people finding, you know, some temporary happiness in, in that, but, um, I'll tell you, you know, you know, you know this and you know, I'll show the audience firsthand that, um, you know, once you make a million dollars again, you know, all you're going to want to do is make two, like you're, you're, you're always right. chasing that rabbit. Right. You, you get comfortable with a man. You, I mean, people find this even just on their jobs. Um, you know, you go from making 40,000 to 50,000, you adjust your lifestyle to 50,000 and now you want 60. Right. right. And, and then you, yeah. you dream of getting 60 and then you get 80. Right. And then you feel good for six months and then you adjust to the 80 and now you want 90. You know, that, that, that the, the goalpost always moves. And yeah, so if you focus I think on, it's key like, to your point yeah. to not try to move the goalpost. I mean, that's something that I've never done is move the goalpost. And what I've found is that through more sacrifice, I've found more happiness personally. So yeah. I think that's something important that you're touching on there. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Jason Javer is our guest today. He's the managing partner at Vista Homes. Um, how can people connect with you, Jason? Um, how can they learn more about uh, you know Vista Homes? And you know, for those that uh, you know are in the Charlotte area, those that are listening, they're in the Charlotte area, or those that may visit the Charlotte area. Um, you know, again, how can they connect um, and learn more about you and, and about the company? Yeah, so you can uh, check out Vista Homes. Well, you know, we're on Instagram, we're on um, Facebook. Our website is vistahomesclt.com. And then also you can uh, you know, find follow me on right now on Facebook. Uh, my name Jason Javer and then you can uh, I'm going to be in the process of starting a podcast as well about Charlotte awesome. entrepreneurship. Um, so kind of connecting with small businesses and we're in the process. We got some interviews going, so um, awesome. You know, my goal with that is to kind of, you know, add value, kind of have conversations like what we're having here to uh, help small businesses that are kind of getting started or at just different phases. So, you know, we're, yeah. I'm going to continue to kind of post information about that as well. Um, yeah. And it's be a cool way to, you know, if you like some of the things that, that you heard, I feel like it's a lot of the kind of messages that that I just want to share with people and I really lo do love business and talking to people. So it's kind of just a side passion project right now, but I'm hoping to really yeah. you know, help people that are, are getting started. Yeah, absolutely. I, I one I commend that, Jason. That's tremendous. I, I love supporting other podcasters and my audience knows that we love to do that. Um, and so I, I'd love to get that information once you have it available. We'd love to stay in touch with you and that way we can share um, your your podcast so that this audience can subscribe as well. Um, I'm a big proponent that, you know, I love for the audience to kind of have an arsenal, right? You kind of think of Batman's tool belt, right? He's got just about everything in there, right? In, yeah, in the for sure. He faces, you know, he pulls something out the tool belt that gets him out of it. And so I, I love for the audience to be that same way. And so, um, yeah, I love that. I think you'll be tremendous for podcasting. Um, I appreciate it. You know, you got a tremendous message. And um, one of the things that I learned in podcasting that I think you probably will see as well, you may already know it because um, I didn't at the time is, you know, how much it can help your business and how much you can organically connect, um, you know, with people that you know, ultimately can, you'll, you'll find, you know, you know, people get to know you and, and your company in a kind of a non-salesy, you know, more, you know, or, organic uh, kind of fashion that, that, you know, really creates a lot of, uh, you know, wins all the way around. So I definitely support you in that, man. And uh, thank you again. I, I'd love to, you know, one, subscribe myself and share it and, and add it to my arsenal. I've got, you know, I've subscribed to a bunch of podcasts. I, I listen to them all the time. And, um, you know, when Thanks. I was that, traveling, that it means a lot. I appreciate it. Oh, you're welcome. And um, you know, when I was traveling a good bit, I'd always pop on a podcast. So I'd love to, when we get back to that, you know, pop you on and hear and kind of interact uh, that way. But uh, so, yeah. So, uh, Jason, again, thank you, man. I, I appreciate your time. Um, thank you. Best, yeah. Best wishes to you personally and professionally. Look to remain connected and uh, enjoy the rest of your day, man. Okay. Awesome. Thanks so much. Appreciate you having me. Awesome. 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 So. We are going to keep uh, keep things flowing. Listen, um, NYB, make sure I'm, I'm in the process of um, adjusting some of my uh, offering right now. I've got so many different sites and you guys know I'm always yeah. sending you guys to different sites. And so um, so NYB community, I want to uh, let you know, I got my website developer working on um, kind of, you know, consolidating some of my brands. It'll be on um, a new website that will have uh, essentially, you know, everything from my real estate to the podcast and 
um, uh, the community advocacy that I do through community banking. And so all those things are interrelated, right? Like I was just talking about with Jason on how we amplify voices in our community and, and send positive messages out there. And so um, be looking for that. And so uh, definitely uh, want to share that with this community. Don't forget about leverage uh, brooksbrothersconsulting.com backslash leverage the financial software. Thank you for those that uh, participated on uh, the demo last week. If you want a copy of that demo, email me uh, again. That's Ron at the MYB podcast.com. Listen, we're going to get out of here. Thanks so much again to my guest today. Uh, Jason with uh, Vista Homes. Make sure you go to Vista Homes CLT dot com. That's going to be in the show notes. Make sure you go there, check it out and uh, connect with Jason. Let you, let him know that you heard him right here on the Minding Your Business podcast episode number 193. Jason, again, thank you so much, man. Um, thank you. So, Appreciate it. It was fun. Absolutely. Yep, absolutely. NYB community, thank you so much again. Again, you know, remember that there's three things that we all want, no matter how we look in the mirror, right? No matter our gender, no matter our race, no matter where we're from, there are three things we all want. We all want to do a little better for ourselves, a little better for our families, and a little better for our communities. So keep that in mind as you interact with everybody that you come across. I know so much of life has become politicized. Everything has a political statement to it and a political spin. Um, even this pandemic, we find some kind of way to to make Matt wearing a mask, a political statement <laughs> um, or, or different things. And, and I get that. Right. But, um, you know, this is a human deal. And what Jason, and I talked about is a human deal. And uh, I encourage you all. Um, let's let's get back to being human beings. OK. All right. Champ Ron, the Mind of Your Business podcast. Take care.